All right, welcome, listeners. Welcome to Kyle and Cody's Cult Cinema Cast. Uh, just me this week. Cody is uh, busy, but I got um our, our, our old friend uh, Yannick Ambrose showing back up. Hey, how's it going, man? Uh, thanks for letting me uh, back on the show. It was fun last time, so I'm excited to uh, to talk about the the next uh, crazy uh, film I got going. Yeah, no, uh, Yannick has a new movie out, Mondo Hollywood Land, uh, just released. Um, yesterday as of the recording so you can uh, th- you can find it on amazon currently um if you're in the u.s canadian release comes out in november correct yeah it'll be on uh uh prime in uh in november so yeah right now it's just uh <clears throat> uh Bloom and i have uh it out right now in the usa amazon and then the uk too yeah, no. Um yeah, no. I'm I'm probably showing a few of my friends once the uh it officially comes out up here. You know, a couple of people that would probably be interested, so I'll probably do a thing about that. Yeah, this uh, we had talked a little bit uh, last time. Why don't you give like a quick little blurb about it? Well, so the audience. Yeah, so um you know, it, Mondo Hollywoodland uh basically this, you know, psychedelic comedy kind of experimental film that uh, follows a uh, kind of groovy uh, mushrooms dealer who's played by uh, the uh, my, my producing partner on it and co-writer, uh, Chris Blim. And it uh, basically follows him as he traverses through Hollywood uh, with this uh, kind of man from the fifth dimension narrator. And they go through Hollywood to try to discover what the meaning uh, of Mondo is. And, you know, through that, they kind of uh, encounter these, like, you know, Hollywood types in the in, in the film industry. They encounter fringe groups in politics. They kind of encounter these dreamers. And it's kind of broken up into these three segments, the Titans and Weirdos and Dreamers. And, yeah, it's just a kind of a psychedelic voyage into uh, all things Mondo. And uh, a little bit of an homage to the 60s uh, and 70s films uh, that maybe we'll get into in a little bit. But, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, no, I yeah, I watched it all the way through already. It's a pretty, it's a pretty damn good movie. I'd definitely give it at least I'm eight or nine on it. That's pretty decent. Definitely worth your time if you're looking uh, yeah. to uh, get that up, uh, get a look on that. Yeah, I, I one of my uh, you mentioned the man from the fifth dimension and that he was honestly one of my favorite characters. Uh, I I was listening to him narrate the beginning of the movie and i was just prepared to listen to that man for an hour <laughs> i just thought he was one of the best narrator characters i've seen in the movie yeah it was interesting because we um you know we we originally uh i was i was used to be really into um these uh hollywood documentaries and they were also there were a lot of the times narrated by like people like james mason and like christopher Plummer. so we kind of were like like you know, oh, that'd be cool if, and because of, you know, obviously we're trying to go for something more experimental, like what if the narrator kind of breaks the wall and is actually talking to the people and, you know, that's obviously, I guess, been done to some extent, but not, not as much as that they talk to the characters. So in earlier drafts, he was, or or cuts rather, uh, and drafts of the script, he was much more like interacting with the characters but we felt once we set it up, like you said in the beginning, we can kind of put a little bit of a backseat and just kind of set up the rules a little bit. But yeah, obviously it's it's a little wacky, it's a little it's a little crazy. But um, but yeah, no, that's cool. And the, and the uh, the narrator is uh, it's voiced by uh, Ted Evans, and he's a really talented uh, voice actor that uh, Blim knows, and he uh, great impressionist and stuff like that. So he's great. Um, so yeah, we, that was a fun process. And Mar. Uh, the writer on it with us, our other co-writer Marcus Hart, really you know, he really crushed it with uh, the 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 the, right, the the dialogue of the narrator. He's a very uh, verbose person, so he was like able to really kind of give it this, uh, you know, this kind of uh, this the right kind of vibe. You know what I mean? In especially in the very early sections, you do see like it's uh, you're very it's it kind of plays like his first like it's a first person view and you take advantage of uh something we had talked a little bit about last time is shooting of uh the shooting of this on iphone and you get stuff that's and you get like these scenes where the guy i think he crawls over or through some people and you get that that uh 
scream uh, that uh shot which would be like an impossible angle with any mate like any uh full-on hollywood camera certainly would have been impossible for anything um, uh, like as little as 25 years ago even and it's you'd take absolute advantage and uh, advantage of it and it really sold me on the um the camera uh, the use of it in this film yeah, no, I, I think that was one of the uh, kind of, you know, because early, early on, the, the original inception of all this was I saw a screening of Mondo Hollywood, which is a 1967, like, Mondo film. Um, and it's like, it's more, it's more of a documentary. It's not, narrative, it's not a, a, uh, a narrative film. And that was in 2014, and Paul Thomas Anderson presented it. And it was and it's by Robert uh, Cohen, uh, and it's a great weird film you know like in the from the 60s so the original inception was like oh let's do a virtual reality version that's like modern times so i actually was out to you know a few protests in like 2015 i think and the original idea was to make this a vr film and uh i didn't like vr i felt like it defeated a lot of the purpose of being wanting to make movies because i do think it's cool to have the audience be the camera or whatever but like I don't know. It's just me, me personally. I know friends, uh, yeah. very talented director Ilya Roskov, who uh, he's into that stuff, and, and that's it's it's its own art. And I, and I, I he's so talented, and he's he makes these great VR things. But for me personally, in this movie, I was like, you know, I think what's something closer to that, where it's like it's something I can kind of get away with, with just bringing around to certain places, or like, and so the, the iPhone was the next thing, you know, so. I remember actually, I was I used to really bother the shit out of um, Francis Ford Coppola's lawyer by basically being like, "Do you have a? Can I speak to him? Can I speak to him? Can I speak to him?" And this was years ago, and he was eventually just like, "Ah, oh, yeah, fine, okay, I'll like just send a email. Maybe he'll speak to you." And luckily, he was able to. I, you know, he like responded and was like, "Yeah, let's." And he just like called me one day. It was horrifying. I was like, "Oh my god." And he basically was, like, giving me this whole spiel about how, you know, it's all about story and acting, and you shouldn't be too concerned, especially if you don't have any money, which I, I didn't. And I, and I mean more like, you know, like a million dollars or a couple hundred thousand dollars. Like, this, this, this is a very small budget movie. So he's like, just don't worry about the camera, because it's like, it, nobody, like, it, it doesn't matter as much as maybe younger, sometimes uh, newer filmmakers think especially if they don't have a lot of money. Like you don't want to spend all your money on your camera and nothing in your production design and not put too much thought into the acting and all that stuff. And, you know. So then that kind of gave me the idea of just, okay, well, I'll just do it on an iPhone because I can't afford a, a camera and like all these things, right? So I just started shooting stuff and, and kind of messing around with it. And then, uh, you know, Blim, once Blim came on board, the whole thing really changed because and then that was like an actor. And then we kind of were like, all right, let's do this together. So me and him started really making the movie together and kind of collecting all these great actors, really talented actors we know and friends. And, and we, yeah, just having that iPhone was we were able to shoot in the places we wouldn't be able to shoot otherwise. And like you said, uh, the camera movements and stuff, that's just kind of me running around and moving my arms and like what that would normally would require some sort of like, crane or something you know like all these other like little gadgets that would be on set with like that would require crew members but there wasn't really any crew members it was just me and uh me and blim and then a few days we had like you know um aaron who plays caesar that's i you know think what he's an incredible actor but he would help us with sound sometimes but like, mostly it was really just you know backpack iphone and that really gave us the freedom and, and you know it obviously it, it it doesn't look like a traditional movie because of that sometimes, but it also gave us the ability to just go out and do really weird stuff, you know, that, like you said, would normally require, like, manpower, like, man and woman power to, like, really, like, hold a camera in certain places and, and you know, that are extremely heavy and large and, like, all these things, but we didn't have to worry about that. I mean, you can just flail around my arm and make a crazy effect because the iPhone weighs, you know, nothing, you know, <laughs> so... Yeah, I feel like you get like that little bit of uh, like you talked about having it be a VR. You get some of that stuff that would be neat about having a VR movie without having to like com uh, fully commit to it, which 
sounds like maybe bad when you say it like that, but it's like allows you, like a lot of people would don't really, like you said, a lot of people don't really, um, aren't as hard on VR as some people. And you get like, okay, here are some of the cool shots we could do with VR, but without like having to be forced into it for like an entire hour, 40 mo hour, 40 minute long movie. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and yeah, no, I, that, that, that was like a very old idea and, and it, it just really, uh, like I said, really transformed, especially once I, uh, you know, Blum and I started working together. Then, then we really started to make a narrative movie before it was like this weird, like doc thing, but like, and then it really turned into like what it is, which is a narrative film, you know? Yeah. I, I love, um, a lot of the psychedelic, ex uh, set dressing you have in this. I love, uh, the guy's name, I'm just, the character's name, uh, oh, Boyle? Yeah, Boyle. Yeah, boy, Norman Boyle. I do like his little, I, I, I was really sold on the, uh, psychedelic, uh, fifth dimensional chair he has in his room that we see in the early parts of the movie with the plasma ball, uh, which is just one of my favorite props of all time. And like you're taking advantage. Oh of that. yeah, man, dude, that's I, I, that's too bad. It's too bad Blim's not here now because that that would that would really get him uh, pumped up because that was all him, man. He he fucking he 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 crushed the production design for mm -hmm. for a lot of the movie and this. I mean, but especially that whole section. So he built that chair. That chair was kind of like, you know, I think one of the obviously cooler parts of the movie, and that was all him. And and he really went. Really went really went wild with that set deck, and uh, I remember shooting that with him, and it was just so fun to shoot all these crazy little gizmos and gadgets he has. You know, it's like, uh, you know, he has like this ability to be like a, like a little bit of this like Tim Burton like you know Terry Gilliam thing, where he just kind of he puts these objects in the scenes, and it really accentuates what I'm trying to and what the, us as writers are trying to do. He'll throw in these things as like. And then it'll just it'll enhance the scene through through set deck and through production design. So yeah, that's super cool. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, the chairs though. <laughs> oh yeah, I I loved it because it's kind of I don't know if there's a name for this, but like a like a um, that whenever they say like steampunks or cyberpunks, but there needs to be a word for like would you call it imagination punk, where it's just like taking kind of everyday objects. That like you looked at as a kid and like, oh yeah, that's a fancy thing that I would pick up and play pretend as as a kid and like show and showing it as if it's like advanced, like mystical technology. I think you'd call it imagination punk and I I just really have a soft spot from it. I've like, um, that was kind of what, why I bought that, uh. They made a South Park video game, The Stick of Truth, where uh, all the South Park kids are going around dressing and playing as, uh, like, they're playing pretend fantasy for a di for the length of the game, and that's what sold me on that. And I do, I just think there should yeah, be more yeah. of that. The, the yeah. co-writer, 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 uh, Marcus Hart, he's into South Park. I, I don't know the reference that much, but I'm sure he would. <laughs> but yeah, no, totally, man. I, I think, uh, I think that I think that's one thing we all wanted to really. You know, when you make a movie, you're like, there's all these like negative thoughts in your head of like, oh, is this like, this isn't, this isn't um, like, you know, a traditional movie with like, you know, even like, I obviously, I think there is like, obviously really drawn out or, or important character beats for all that, but it's not like a, a one character centric piece about like, you know, dr dramatic elements of like, oh, what happens to this person and stuff like that. It's 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 really out there, and I think we wanted to kind of, um, you know, I'm trying to. It's hard to explain almost, but like we really wanted to like make sure this was unique and just to, it was simple way, simple way to put it. Like we wanted to make sure this was something that like with a lot of thought and care put into the stuff that is that would make it unique, but really make it stand out because there are just so many movies out there right now, right? Like there's a lot of like then that's great the democratization of film is like fantastic that's something actually coppola talks a lot about if anybody's interested in not checking out what he has to say about that on like youtube you can find it about how like in the future it's just all going to be like you know people being able to just make stuff you know and i think that we're seeing that but like well then, then that begs the question like well how do you stand out so like you know we hope that this film does 
at least at the very least even if you hate it even if you hate the movie it's like you, you know you at least have to we were hoping that somebody will say well you know it is original <laughs> you know what i mean so so i think because i think that's what it's all about i mean when you make when you make stuff it's like it's trying to kind of like uh, push the boundaries a little bit and and not try to recreate something that was great and 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 not to say that you know we're not heavily influenced by all these great artists before us mm-hmm. but like we really wanted to kind of stick to something where it's imaginative like what you said and unique and bizarre and all those kind of things so so using all the elements of filmmaking we you know we did our best to try to kind of like do that you know through through writing through production design through editing through just acting even you know the tight tight like the, the kind of you know total shifts of acting in the movie i think are very odd but but interesting so yeah and, and that goes obviously all to our amazing cast there's so many good actors in the movie you know alex loinez and Alyssa sabo miranda hart you know palmer jones like every we just have all these like great actors and that makes it so much easier for someone like me who just can kind of sit there and be like oh these people are so smart and they're going to come up i mean a lot of it's improv you know so all these kind of elements gave it this unique uniqueness to it. That's really because of all the people involved, you know? Yeah, I, I really did. Um, I, I kind of get this kind of the, like my, my kind of thing. Part of why I enjoy the aesthetic of it is like taking um, the adult world, which uh, it is kind of can be kind of stingy and boring and, a lot of like real problems in it and it's kind of and it's doing what it can through production design and the talent of the actors and the uh direction of the script to like reclaim the joy in life like uh i do uh, like especially this comes out in the second section of the movie where we're talking to the weirdos and they're doing the uh section in where uh the guy builds giant spheres as like art projects and i kind of like that where he's just like trying to create something wonderful out of some some would say sort of like these more squalid conditions i've seen play and i've i've, I've met people like this in real life who take these sort of more run down areas and try to make the most out of them i remember talking to a guy in germany who was trying to like keep up the memory of this uh old rundown um sort of like a it was sort of like a homeless shelter type thing but uh a bit fancier than that but it's really nice and that kind of brings me to the next thing i want to talk about is um the use of drugs in the movie because uh this is something that's uh controversial in uh in the... very very much. yeah very yeah much. why why don't you give your thought some thoughts i'm just what do you th- about how you use them and your philosophy toward them because i know that's a lot of things that people are going to be curious about um in their own works and in their own lives and whatnot yeah yeah i mean look <laughs> it's you know it's um drugs are very much a thing in life right and you know it's like <laughs> i don't know it's a funny thing you're talking about but like I, look the, the the mushroom stuff i personally uh am not like i i've never taken it i've never taken acid no me neither i, I don't yeah. i don't even drink or I, I used to drink i i don't i used to drink i don't drink anymore i mean i i don't it's like to me the stuff this the but the mushroom stuff there is I think there's there is a lot going on there in terms of what's going on in like in in medicine right now, right? Mm-hmm. And this isn't something I'm not saying we were thinking of and stuff like that, but I will say like, you know, I, I think while that's happening and there are some like actual like medical data to look at like helping with mm-hmm. PTSD and all these things, we really just looked at it as a way we always wanted to have it just be like, almost like a potion. Right, so it's almost like it, like if this was like in uh in, in some mid it's in some uh fantasy movie, it would just be Boyle's potion. But of course, we're in a reality. We're in uh we're in Hollywood. That's a psychedelic film, so naturally, it's a drug that people can that like people like and people are like interested in. Like oh, interesting. Like I I take that or whatever or part of that or they like to go to like you know after hour parties and go to like 
um, go to like raves, whatever, whatever that is. But really, I, I like to look at it like, especially in terms of the mushrooms, that it's almost like a, like in a fantasy, like if it was like some, you know, uh, like, you know, Lord of the Rings type, it's almost like that's Boyle's potion that he gives to those people. And what his po what the potion does, mushrooms, you know, because that's what it is in the movie, but the potion that he makes, like, it, it almost like, and you maybe, you know, this is just my, the way I see it, because I know it's up to everybody else how they see it, but kind of the potion, what it does is it, it makes every character kind of double down on themselves. So every, and I'm not to say that's what mushrooms does. I, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't know. Oh, yeah. But like the potion that Boyle makes for people, double, it makes everybody double down in their little story. So like uh, Ted, the producer, he doubles down and says, I have to become, uh, a, you know, I'm a producer. I'm going to be a tough producer. And that's really his story. He just got, and then even though it contradicts uh, uh, Paloma's character, the, the actress, the, the younger one, the, uh, the, the star, she doubles down on herself too. So I'm not going to take shit from these fucking executives because this is my life. You know what I mean? We're, you know, it's like, a, it's same thing with the, uh, uh, Daphne, the Antifa girl. She doubles down. She blows up a fucking Nazi's car. The Naya, she wants to make the discussion. She feels insecure. She eventually reaches that point of, okay, I'm going to do a discussion. It doesn't need to be the biggest thing in the world, like a big protest. It could be a few people, and that matters. The Anna character, she doubles down on her. Barry, I mean, Barry's a little bit more in the, you know, kind of a delusional uh, state. But, like, still, he doubles down. He's like, I'm going to make Barry's gym, you know? So all the characters have that in common, I think. And I think that's what the Boyle's potion does so that that's i think that's the best way to answer it and, you know the rest of it look remember it is a mondo movie so i think having uh the shock value of kind of some of the characters doing certain crazy things is just kind of fun and stuff like that but, but yeah so that's how i best kind of describe that and then you know it's just you know it's just kind of funny i think <laughs> i mean like i don't know like blim and i would sit there and kind of laugh and just be like oh that's funny so like so yeah that's kind of how we just uh you know break it down into maybe a more like uh you know, intellectual sense about the, the, the shrooms, but I, I think that there, that's how, that's how I've always kind of viewed it when I, you know, like when looking at it now or even editing it or, or workshopping it with like Marcus and Blim and all that kind of stuff is being like, oh, that's what they do. They do, they double make the character double down on themselves. And that kind of uh, creates this element of like, you know, empowerment or whatever. And, you know, it's, and that, that, yeah, so that's probably how I tackle that, uh, that that tough question you give me. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's true to life. I think that's a reasonable answer. Like, because it's um, these things go back thousands of years. They've been used, sort of like that, and like at least that in um, in some potential. Like you connect. There's uh, spirit like uh, spiritual practices where people take them to go down certain paths, and it's one. Of the, I think that's. I think mushrooms could be described like are could be described as like one of those things that's kind of reminiscent of magic potions because it's something that's kind of like some uh witchcraft guy kind of like craft uh, crafts and does a certain way to give someone an experience i think that's a perfectly reasonable way to view it in in uh this version um and it does fit with our theme because we're people go to boil because he's the man who knows and he's trying to give people a thing and that's perfectly translates into there yeah, yeah. a little bit of a he's a little bit of a uh of a of a not a not a not an accredited or, or doctorate but he's like he's a little bit of like a like a odd scientist you know what i mean so that yeah it's kind of like like with the potions and all that kind of thing so we kind of look look to that a little bit and i i do also uh appreciates use as a way to connect all the um separate layers of characters the titans the weirdos and the dreamers is that uh there's all some degree of them using it and uh th that's obviously how they all know each other uh, a lot of the main characters are guys who talk to Boyle and get their stuff from him so that's the the through line through all of them and yeah it's a nice little narrative tool I do one other thing I did appreciate, which I noticed um, in the dreamers section is um, your use of 
um, the cats as symbolism because uh, the cats are <laughs> like something all, all, all the dreamers, uh, dreamer characters have a cat. And uh, that's, I think, symbol to me, symbolized the cat being their dream, which is a nice little image of for me as a person who likes the cats. And I won't go into what too much of what happens with uh, Boyle's cat, because that would give away too much of the movie. But it is yeah, yeah, yeah. Some, yeah something that's uh, I, I certainly noticed and I really appreciate. I like my I can always sign off on cat imagery. Yeah, so the cat thing was 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 I don't even man, I don't even really it, I, you could probably tell there was like a lot of stuff shot. So it was like it was so interesting. Like we kind of started from I think something with the early on with uh, the cat, Lim and Marcus and I or something. We must have thought I don't I'm not exactly even sure the original inception of that. But anyway, once we kind of knew that was there, we kind of just like slowly started putting this is boil for the audience. So Boyle, this is no sweat. Right in the beginning, we know that Boyle, the main character, loses his cat, and he's devastated by it. And it's like you know that's one of the the, the his his plots, right? And the his get his the rats are in the attic, and the cat used to take care of that for him. So now he's like just lost and all this kind of thing, right? But throughout the movie. It's not so much like he's on a mission to find his 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 cat. It's more like he's kind of just been he's he's done with it, right? Like he's kind of like it's 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 not a story about him finding it. But throughout the movie, there's a lot of things that allude to kind of um, the fact that that still that saw, that thing is still out there, and it's, it's and it's sad for him. And and yeah, like you said, the imagery we'd always try to like some of the times it was like coincidences, dude. It was so weird. It was like. We would be shooting something. We're like, is that a cat in frame? Or like, is that there's like a poster of a cat? And like, there'd just be like a few times where it almost it was almost accidental. But there was obviously times where we were like, you know, like, oh, like let's have this actor draw a cat. You know, like just just put, kind of sprinkle it out um, throughout the movie, just so you don't forget it. And it's a little bit like, you know, a little bit like, like subliminal, like in something. You know, I use that in a very benign way, but like. Like, yeah, very, like, uh, just sprinkled, th like, riddled throughout the whole movie, just to kind of have it in the back of your, you know, brain, like, oh, yeah, that's, that's something that still is out, is, is a thing, you know? Hmm. Next thing I want to kind of talk about is, uh, you, you actually very successfully kind of portray all levels of Hollywood, because Hollywood's not just the big shots that are there, there's also, like, lower end guys, there's, um, scenes in the dreamers where uh, a lot of it deals uh, one of the characters subplots is she's dealing with smaller productions uh we see plays getting set up and stuff like that um and you shown all three of these layers also and the weirdos is a bit more the people who live there and you're showing like a nice a little more political yeah the weirdo the weirdo I mean yeah, the weirdo section is definitely the more political um, aspect for sure. But yeah, no, I think like I, I would say uh, like yeah for sure. But I also I also would say that you know there's a lot of uh, like if because I live in Hollywood, right? So like there's a lot of elements of Hollywood that are not in this movie. So it's like it, it, it like and it's not not say that any kind of like self like self deprecating like oh we didn't do a good job, but like it's more in this kind of like fun silly way because it's like. There's a lot of elements and pieces of, of Hollywood that are that are important that have that are just not that are totally like glossed over, but but yeah, but ultimately we kind of thought like okay, Titans weirdos dreamers, right? So Titans would be maybe the people with a little bit more money. The weirdos would be people who maybe, you know, maybe are a little bit like more they're thinkers, right? So like they're 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 think politics. They don't even they don't care about movies. You know, they're they're more like let let's let's uh let's let's tear down the system or make it better. Right, those types of people, um, and then the dreamers are really that you know that obviously I think we're, I think the dreamers part right probably resonates a lot of people who move out here because it's obviously that's more about like the struggle of, of like not just being like having money and stuff, but like actually doing the the you know doing the doing the work to try to get your dream a reality, which is like whether it be an actor or Barry, who's you know a character who's you know you know and he's who's on a little bit on the older side and he's really still you know 
he's so determined to the point where he's like this jack guy and he's like i'm gonna get my gym and all these kind of things so like yeah so we we definitely wanted to like we would i wouldn't say it like represents we do a good job of exactly like representing hollywood in the best way in like terms of like the types of people and the, the but but like yeah we wanted to just get like the kind of general vibe in essence especially for a comedy you know I kind of one one part I really liked uh, I I thought was interesting was um, in the Titan section, uh, you have the uh, young starlet who's um, very much like um, a idea of like these bratty Disney ch- like I don't know Disney Channel it's not just them I don't want to pin it all on one company but these uh, bratty young starlets who are difficult to work with. And to make all these demands despite not seeming all that talented. And I think you uh, do a decent job of actually like portraying her point of view in a way that, if not sympathetic, at least like you get the logic going on there. And um, that's something I kind of want to talk about. Yeah, I mean, look, I, that's played by that's yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's played by Miranda Ray Hart, really talented um a uh, comedian actress uh improv actor um she's she's incredible but like no 100 percent. and this was uh I, I really you know this is me just speaking for me but i would say for him it's like no the whole, totally i think the whole point of that was to actually be like no i i, I mean me I, I agree with her i mean like the script that she's reading does suck she should get paid as much as the other person they are kind of annoying why aren't they listening to her about the lines? The lions do suck. She's right about almost everything. Now she can be a li- look because when you're in a position, when you're in a position where people have been screwing you over, you can't trust anybody because you shouldn't. Not to say Ted's character's back, because I think he's just kind of a he's middle management. He's not the he's not the the big boss on top. So she shouldn't trust any of these people. So in and this is just for me speak. I don't want to speak for Miranda because she's so much the character. But I would, I you know, we've talked about it before. But no, I, I, I guess see me personally, it's like, yeah, I, I would totally agree with with because you have to for someone like that in that their position, you have to be tough. You can't give them an inch because they'll just keep exploiting you. So for that character to kind of be the way she is, that's strategic. She's not doing it just to kind of just for just to be bratty. I, so I, I really, I, it's cool you, you brought that up because I, I really, I really believe that. I really believe that uh, that's, you know, that's what we were going for. You know, there's been some people who have been like, oh, she's just, she's unlikable. It's like, but if you really think about it, if you really break mm-hmm. it down and if you break it down you go, okay, why would she trust any of these people? Why wouldn't show And if she was being too nice to these people, they would just continue to roll over her and ask for these certain things, which is very fucked up. So in many ways, like I said, though, not so much to the character Ted, because I think the character Ted is, like I said, a little bit more middle management. I don't think he's, he just wants to like get this thing done, but ultimately to the system, the system that pretty much, you know, that really got like gaslights these, these young actors and, and, and they, they exploit their labor. I mean, technically, <laughs> right. I mean, even if they got paid millions of dollars, they're still doing it. So like yeah no it's so cool that you, you brought that up because I, I I think that's uh, that's definitely what we were going for is to not just be like oh look at these bratty stars it's like obviously there's comedy in it too so it's not like a dramatic piece about just that but it's like but no underneath the the comedy and the silliness and stuff I I, I think that's totally what we were going for is to kind of really actually give the point of view of that of someone in the, in that position you know. Yeah, because because every because po- every point of like oh she's fulfilling the stereotype for every point of that there's a point of like hey there I am working in a particular space uh, she's wealthy she doesn't need to necessarily take some of this shit like even if um even if like I think she points out even if this movie entirely falls out through it's going to be somewhat fine for her. Because she's got a certain amount of money, and then also, like, particularly we show we see um, what happens to some of the actress uh, actresses working on the lower end of Hollywood uh, later in the movie in the uh, dreamers section, and when particularly in the scene where they're talking about the play, and that actress stands up to the director there, those are she's got some very similar complaints, but. Um, they're just in very different positions. And let's be frank, there's a, a terrible, like, there are horror stories about stuff happening to 
these young actresses and y- y- she's got to watch out for herself. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it's and also in those, in those, in those acting classes too, in those acting classes, sometimes you think of these like, you know, Oh, look, it's like a bunch of, it's like a professor and he's teaching these students. There's a lot of toxic shit going on in those acting classes. I not, you know, like, so, so I was, uh, uh, I was really excited that, uh, as a writing team and, 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 and all that kind of stuff that, um, you know, we, we had something like that. And like I said, through comedy, of course, but like, but like, you know, the, the character, the acting teacher is a psychologically abusive character. I mean, he is. I mean, he's literally telling. He's screaming. He's you know. And of course, the joke is that the guy's only fucking been on like Mad, he was on Mad About You, and he's still talking about it. You know, Mad About You is a great show. Don't get me wrong, but it's like it's this kind of, it's this kind of like it's this kind of like you know uh, ridiculous thing where I, I've seen it. I've been to acting classes. Like I don't I don't act. I mean, I acted in this movie, but but I don't I don't act. But I've been to a few classes just to kind of see what it's like. And you know some of these some of these guys are are, are very manipulative and uh, and it's 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 free it's it's really freaky so so there's definitely a parallel there and I think the lower in some ways the lower the uh, it gets in the in the hierarchy of like okay studios this it's still the same type of like toxic shit because in a weird way they like they they might not be exactly in the position where they feel. Some of these acts, I know, I know acting teachers who are fantastic. This is obviously not a broad, broad generalization, but like a few that are, are probably pissed off and they take it out on their students. And that's obviously what that's going on. Because even when she's like, does the great performance, he's like, checks her name. Like, he, oh my God, she's amazing. And then she goes, and mad about you sucks. And he's so petty that he literally just totally reversed his opinion and, and uh, crosses it out. And that's actually something Blim and I uh, did like in the edit room, like way towards the end. And we thought it was really funny. <laughs> so yeah, so he's just so fucking petty that he literally is just like totally reverses all of his excitement about like his student doing well because she like throws a jab at like, you know, a 90s sitcom he was on. You know? So uh, yeah, this is your first feature film, correct? Am I mistaken in that? or? So I, I directed a uh, feature film that was a doc. So yeah, I, I mean, it's weird. It's like, I, I never know whether to say it is or not because it's like, do docs, like, but yeah, it's, it's my second, but like my first narrative feature that I directed and wrote actually, that's produced. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but like, uh, you're fresh. You're pretty much in the midst of this. Why don't you tell, uh, tell the uh, audience like how you're feeling about like, uh, how this experience is different from like the releases of, uh, your shorter films and your doc and how you're uh, oh, going about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. yeah, way different, man. Because I know. So, so just so, so you, so I know. Because uh, what do you, are, are a lot of the, your audience? Uh, do they want to be filmmakers? Is this something that you maybe even like? Because I know last show you were like, oh, do you have any advice? Like, do you want me to? Because I have a lot to say about that. Do you want me to spin it in the in that kind of to to give it to give it a little bit of like a you know lessons learned kind of thing. I, I think we can because that's something that like a lot of people are interested in. And... Yeah, absolutely. So so like it's so different than sh- in shorts because look, it's like you know the movie. I would say the movie was really starting to be shot. Like it was like the movie that it is now was when when uh, me and, and and like Blim really came on when Blim came on and we started to like act it out and then we became narrative. But and then before that, it was more of this kind of like writing thing that Marcus and I were doing. So it, it's had this weird life cycle that exists for like you know six years. You know, <laughs> this is a long time, right? So we shot it three years ago. You know, it it, it takes doing a feature takes a long time, mm-hmm. and it's just so different. And I I really recommend pe- to people to do if they're interested in making movies. To definitely do a few shorts. I mean, you kind of have, you kind of, you really have to. It's just kind of like just to learn. You don't expect, you know, anything mm-hmm. like out of it like crazy. You know, maybe you get into a few festivals and that's awesome. But like, it's not a, it's not a product. And the movie industry is a business. Um, now, if you want to make the just like experimental art, like shorts, which as you know, like we talked about, I did for years. I like doing that. That's fine. There's no, there's no issue with that. I literally do that, and it has. There's no, there's no business behind that. It's just, uh, it's art. It's like painting. Now, you can, of course, there's, you know, odd ways you can kind of go about doing that and make money or whatever. But primarily, that's for art, for art's sake, right? 
for movies, it's a little different. You kind of, it requires money. So if it requires money, you kind of have to make it a commercial thing because you have investors or you're, you want it to get seen and all these things because you put years of labor, which a lot of was put on by all the people involved in this movie, into it. So you have to follow through. You have to actually have it come out. And that takes a long time because there's, especially for a small, small movie, like a really lower micro, micro budget movie, there's just a lot of stuff that needs to like, happen and it takes time for things to happen it's got you know something like this obviously the that the, the editing made it uh took a while because there's so much footage because we shot it in this mockumentary style we weren't shooting specifically like oh this 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 a lot of it was like shot shoot this shoot this shoot this point at that shoot that like you know and it was like so the editing took a while but yeah so it's just collot it's just the biggest difference in the world like it's just it, it's in some ways there's similarities of just being like you know shoot stuff edit release it but no, I mean, all those elements are different because even releasing it, you got to find the distributor. You know, you can't just, you, you got to do right by your cast and make them feel like they're going to get something out of it. And that's by people seeing it. So you don't just want to make, if you include people in your movies, if you, if, and you don't, and you know, especially if, if you don't pay them because you might not have a budget, it can't just be your little art project. It's unfair to them. And I think that's a really important thing that people, I see a lot and I don't, I'm not a fan of because it's like, so you, it's okay if you try and you, and you don't succeed and that doesn't, that's okay. You didn't do wrong by your cast. You really got to try to make sure people see the movie for yourself, for your, you know, your investors, your actors, for your, you know, your producing partners. You got to really just make sure it gets seen and do, or try to your best to get, to get that happen. Cause it's hard. There's so many movies nowadays. So I would say the, the, one of the biggest differences, not just in terms of making the movie, in terms of really uh, getting it out there. It's it's that's I think I think uh, an important lesson to be learned uh, for, for 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 these kind of things, you know. With short films, it's like you know, not a lot of people are probably going to see it. It's fine, it's fine. But like with a feature, you want to really get it out there, um, especially if you have a lot of people involved. And and yeah, hopefully ours will get out there. You know, I so far so far it's been going good. You know, but like uh, but yeah, I would say that's a bit that for some reason when you brought said that to me, maybe because I'm maybe because right now I'm closer to the actual release of the movie. Maybe that's probably why a little recency bias, but that's just came out to be the most of a big difference. And then obviously the the shoot itself, and uh, the the other thing too is how to entertain someone for this long. And this is kind of actually probably one of some of the stuff that I may be underestimating when I just talk about like the actual like release of of, of getting it out there. It's like entertaining somebody for fifteen minutes is way different than trying to keep someone's attention for over an hour, and you know, like an hour, especially an hour, an hour and a half. It's it's all that's that gets down to like great acting like by our by our performers, and uh, and trying to be uh, and and, good, and having really good uh, you know writing partners who really understand how it's like like Marcus is really good at story structure, so he was able to now it might seem like a crazy film or things are happening whatever but if you really look there's character structure three arc structure for each for each character and that has a lot you know Marcus was really he's he's like a very um what's the word he, he he's just basically very rigid on that but 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 that's the best that's what you want because structure screenplay is all about structure right it's not like a it's not a literary thing like if you're like i'm a screenwriter you're not like a it's like a different kind of writer it's all structure so it's uh because that's how you keep people's attention you know and it's so so that's another big thing because in shorts you don't really almost have you know, it's hard, it's hard to almost do, it's in a different way to do a three-act structure in a short, because, you know, I don't only have so much time, but, um, but for a feature, you have to really have that structure so people are able to, you know, continue to watch it and try to be engaged. Now, I'm sure a lot, many people watch this will be, that will be, like, the structure, their whatever, they might not work for them, and they might kind of be like, yeah, like, this is too much, or whatever. But ultimately, if you're a little bit hooked into it, you got to keep them hooked. And that's the biggest difference between a short and a feature. Is a feature, you have to make sure that uh, in the writing, it really is structured out, that it's saying, okay, catalyst, you know, it begin, first of, you know, first beat of act one, the story kind of begins. Halfway through the, the, the movie, there's the point of no return for the character. And then there's the low point, the character hero is kind of all is lost. You know, in this case, like it's when, like, you know, he's kind of just given up on the rats, you know, in this kind of crazy movie. And he's, you know, looking at himself in the mirror. And, he, and then there's the moment of the triggers, the, the climax. And then the climax is the hero versus the villain. 
and then there's the resolution. And it's like, that's the most important thing when you make, when you make a feature and the biggest difference between a short, a short could just be kind of like a funny scene or whatever, but a feature requires that scope. And I don't care how experimental your film is, you probably should have some version of that if it's a feature. Otherwise, it's really hard to keep the audience engaged. So we hope we hope that the audience stays engaged for this one. Because we were going for that. Oh yeah, no, um, yeah, I don't think like even non-linear films like a, a do demand structure. Like even like like I, I I've I don't know if I brought this up, but like on the show before, but like Pulp Fiction is a show that a movie that's like these are events that take place completely out of order. But your it's comp uh, and these events are put in a section where it goes to a narrative scope, so it's all very well thought out in a lot of these the oh, best 100%, movies. 100%, and dude. yeah, and yeah, no, I was yeah. so I was just I, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so it, I just watched uh, Pulp Fiction recently, so it's so funny you say that because that is true. Everybody's always like, "Oh, I'll say another example after we talk about this." It's like. But in Pulp Fiction, the character Butch, right? Just I'll just pick a random one. Just three act structure. He's got he, he there. There's a there's an incident where he is gets the the catalyst or the inciting incident is that he you know the fight goes. He decides he's gonna screw over Marcellus Wallace, and then the uh, the catalyst is he forgets uh, his, his his the, the watch situation. He goes to get the watch. He he kills the guy. He's all in at the middle of the second act. He he's go tries to go back home, uh, and then and then the there's the low point. He's literally in a fucking dungeon with the gimp. All is lost for the, the the hero, and then he he escapes. He has a moment of really you know moral uh, decision making whether I should just leave Marcellus Wallace down there with these horrible racist disgusting you know people. And or and uh, and leave and be free, or do I help him because this is so fucked up? And he decides to go do that, and then there's the resolution. I mean, like you know what I mean. So if you just watch that by itself, it would be like it wouldn't be some totally crazy thing, you know what I mean? It's like so yeah. So that that's just that would be it's for me at least. When you brought up a fiction, I just immediately thought of that. And then, like pie too. Some people, someone was like, someone would try to argue with me on this, and they're like, well, look at pie. I like Pi is an extremely structured movie. <laughs> like it's, oh yeah, no, it's one of the most. It's actually almost like oh, it's like formulaic in a good way. It's like it's like it's like eighty. It's like a very like quick movie because it's just basically like a very simple story. Now it's crazy because it's black and white and it's got wide angles, but it's not like some yeah, like you know. So that's not gonna be wrong. I love movies. Some movies that have no that don't do this. You know, yeah. there's some old 60s, you know, movies and stuff that are just wild. But that's cool, too. But, like, I, me personally, just speaking for myself, I tend to really try to lock down lock down on that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and, like, I mean, if you do end up watching pic Pulp Fiction and don't think that last scene where uh, Samuel L. Jackson's holding the gun against those guys robbing the store is, like, the proper climax of that movie, I don't know what to tell you. Um, these are it's all building to a certain thing. And I think some of the movies I've always, the movies I've come out the worst of where it is, I've come out feeling the worst about where like movies where I got to the end. I'm like, this is the climax. This isn't to feel like the emotional end of the film. And yeah, no, it's all very clearly structured. I think that's a lot of things people don't necessarily understand about the, uh, the script writing end of production. Yeah, man, and I, a lot of a lot of credit um, when we were writing this. Uh, Marcus, uh, the co-writer, really helped uh, with the heist stuff, and that that obviously we've gotten really good feedback on that kind of being a good climax because it ties everything together. There's stakes and all that stuff, so that was really we were free. We were I remember, yeah, it was it was a tough thing to think of, but uh, we we finally got through it in large part to the collaboration of, of Marcus with us. And uh, it was awesome. He really, he really did an amazing job. It was really fun to to shoot me, for me to to shoot that kind of really good job that uh, he did of breaking down this kind of Ocean's Eleven like thing. I mean, I won't give anything away, obviously, but some people will check it out. But but like, but yeah. So that that was uh, yeah, man. I couldn't agree more. It's all about it's all about that structure. <laughs>
Yeah, the yeah you gotta you guys gotta, gotta watch the movie for the climax. There is ju- that is just like something really well put together, and you don't quite see it. Co- you don't quite. I, I I certainly didn't quite see the end coming, and then when it happened, I was just like, "Wait, oh my god, what the?" <laughs> it was great. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, great. Um, little psychedelic feature that gets like claims joy from the mundane i gotta say i don't know anything else we gotta talk about yeah you know i got time if you have any other questions i'm chilling no i think that's the main, the main thing i think we got a good little show here i don't really have any big good questions cool, less. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was just curious about, for you uh what, what are some of your like uh, uh favorite psychedelic movies like what uh like what? What's what kind of like anything? Like, are there any, or is that a genre you maybe more you you kind of are a little bit new to? Like, what what's your like uh, relationship to some of those types of movies? Like Fear and Loathing and I mean, Pulp Fiction is I would even say it's, it's not psychedelic, but it's like it's it's definitely groovy, you know? <laughs> yeah. No. Uh. Yeah. I do like the word. I you do like the use of the term groovy in this. I do. I, I do think that term should kind of make a comeback a bit more. It's kind of fun. Yeah, it never. Uh, it went. Away, you know, the, the the word groovy went away. So it was just we kind of we. I it was just being Flim and I just found it funny. We just kind of were like, we'll just, yeah, we just kind of, kind of kept calling things groovy. It was like, what? it's a good word. I don't use it enough. Um, I'm a little newer to the genre. I've picked up a bit more of it because of the show, and I've been listening to a bit more of that sort of music lately. I've one of the bands I've really appreciated lately is Iron Butterfly. Um, I've got most of their albums now actually on vinyl. I've been, I got like a, you, they, there's a guy out of my town running like a used record store. So I've been getting in more into that. Interesting seeing like a record store in a town of 10,000 people in this day and age. No, I've, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, no. And it's like this, there's, like a wide range of gambits of like um the happy psychedelic movies and like the um that where this where this one sits and then like the uh really almost medical turn uh medical time of like the 1960s like a film i watched that was kind of like in this more serious vein is um David Cronenberg's first movie Stereo, which is like an art house film with like it's doesn't yeah, have yeah, any native yeah, audio. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. That's why I asked, man. I'm gonna write that one down. I, I know David Cronenberg, but I never actually saw it. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna put that in my little cue that up. It is an interesting movie. It is like obvious, like it's not something everyone's gonna walk away from. Like, and it's certainly not a perfect movie, but it's like a, a black and white movie with uh no native onset audio because uh the camera he used or the camera he had rented to make that film was too loud and if you tried to record audio on set it would it would come across on uh the recording and which is just the struggle of making an independent movie in the 1960s is you just get these cam uh, these nightmare cameras that are just impossible to use and it's um yeah it's about like these guys getting into like uh going under a medical experiment where they get into like a become like a telepathic hive mind it's really interesting yeah that's really cool yeah hell yeah yeah um yeah one other thing before we go too is um yeah no i'll, I'll definitely uh, when, and when maybe when it releases in canada um you can uh you can have on like uh um Miranda Ray Hart and Alyssa Sabo or something like maybe it's two of the actors or something like that because it'll be cool to get their perspective you know because I hate speaking for the, I, you know when I do these I don't want to speak for the because the film's all about collaboration so it's like you know it's like it, it, with everybody involved every single every single person so like having them come on they might have some really cool stuff to say about some of the questions you had on earlier especially about like Paloma the the actress and stuff like that so so yeah man I look I really appreciate it show's awesome as you, as I said in the last show, I'm a big fan of Canada, to my uh, to my but my my buddies up in the north. So uh, really cool to come on with. Yeah, no, um, good. Yeah, it's always great country. I'm re- I'm reading a book currently about like the history of Can- Canadian horror movies, and we've got some good ones. I'm in the '90s currently. I'm not quite done. 
that's my current project. But yeah, no, it's great country, oh, great cool. movies. Yeah, that's something I would know nothing about. Like that's so cool. That's what, that's what's so cool about like cinema is you keep kind of finding these like sub genres and geography and like and yeah, and every and, and definitely keep me posted on you like find cool stuff because what I like to do if I follow obviously the movie uh, 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 and if you can on uh, Instagram to the audience uh, Mondo Hollywood Land. Um, and then you can follow the company's uh, uh, assembly line entertainment. So I'll post a lot. I do a lot of deep dives and weird stuff into like old movies and like. So if you're into that, like maybe we can even do something with that horror stuff. But like, but like, yeah, I love like finding like uh, the mix and crannies of like little subgenres of film and like kind of like that kind of stuff. And then I'll follow Good Hammer TV, which is uh, Blim's company. Uh, but yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah, I've uh, my my habit recently has just been like. I've occasionally just gotten a hold of like all the VHSs with like weird movies and like some of them have been good. I think I found one that's called Thunder Fist on the counter. I can find nothing about it. It's some Korean Kung Fu mo uh, martial arts movie and it's great. Um, I just wish I had a better print of it, but it's it's a fun little journey going on finding yeah, weird movies. That's, 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 that's some like. Uh... That's some cinephile stuff when you only when you're like I have only have the VHS. <laughs> VHSs are so weird. I have, I have some at home. Yeah, I have some at home, but I there but there the quality is it's tough because it's like it's like yeah the quality is just rough. But like it is what it is. I mean, it kind of makes it cool though, you know. I I have a uh, my I still have my VHS player and uh, Cody occasionally makes fun of me for it because I like watch movies for the show on VHS because I've had a couple of them <laughs> and it's been fun. Um, yeah, it's probably a different kind of viewing experience. It's yeah, a bit of a, it's, it's probably, probably closer to to like a it, obviously not a good uh, you know a good reel of film that you're watching on a good projector, but like. It it is literally kind of a reel, you know. So it does feel probably a little bit more like a, like it's like it's a little bit more closely associated film. I'm not the film expert or the celluloid kind of film, like um, that kind of stuff expert. I got I gotta say, Marcus is probably a little bit better at that stuff. But but like uh, but yeah, it's cool. I I I really dig all the kind of old, uh, you know, the finding old movies and the VHSs and, uh, and and finding reels from old movies and all that stuff it's uh it's it's part of the excitement and the, and uh, and the, like the whole like life or the journey of like cinema you know what i mean it's just like not just about all the big movies but kind of about these little things that kind of existed in a place and time and you know we can kind of like find them and it's like it's it's cool i got my from my last haul i got this film i got this vhs tape it's like in this really ratty container. It's called Starship. I have no idea what I'm in for. I'm watching it sometime tonight, but it's going to be interesting. That's what my evening is. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. awful. And I, yeah, no. Um, yeah, great to talk to you. Uh, I guess repeat where they can find you and the movie and your other mo and your other uh, films. Yeah, so um, the movie is on Amazon Prime in the U.S. right now. It'll be available in the U.K. and then it'll be available in Canada. In November, and maybe we can revisit. We'll, we'll chat again then, or something. And then you can find the uh, follow us on Instagram at Mondo Hollywoodland, um, and then feel free to also follow the company uh, Assembly Line Entertainment. Uh, that's mine. Uh, you know, we do a lot of cool stuff on, on Instagram, and then uh, Blims, which is at Good, at Good Hammer TV. So Mondo Hollywoodland on Instagram, and Amazon Prime is where you can watch it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you can remember, uh, you guys can still follow the podcast on uh, wherever you wherever you guys follow podcasts. We got Facebook at Kyle and Cody's called Cinemacast. There's also an Instagram. Uh, I got my Twitter at Lord Brokenshire. Uh, you can watch this on YouTube now. Um, this will most likely go up day and day with when I uh, upload it on YouTube. But uh, yeah, that's something you can pretty reliably find the new episodes on if you're if that's how you prefer to watch these things. So yeah, we'll see you. I think how I got this working out is later this week when we review Uwe Bulls in the name of the King. <laughs> see you guys later. Yeah.